Welcome to the new property show. My name is Steve McManaman. In this episode, we're gonna cover the five steps to building a brand new home. Secondly, we're going to cover off a little visit we took to the House and Land Expo. We're gonna hear from industry insiders about their thoughts in the market in 2023. Last but not least, we're gonna check in with our panel. We're gonna ask them how they would select the right builder and the steps and processes they would go through for identifying not only cost, not only the price, but of course, the right steps and processes to getting it right and making sure that you get the right end product. We're gonna have a really good look at Queensland and why that's seeing such a significant growth. Uh, in the last 12 months, we've seen over 75,000 Melburnians and Sydney siders move up there to Queensland. There's kind of one reason, um, and I think that reason really is cost of living is extremely low, rental return is great for investors, and of course, the weather's a little bit warmer. Uh, so recently we've spoken about why Queensland's Australia's number one hotspot. Apart from the Brisbane Olympics coming in 2032, there's a lot of infrastructure, a lot of projects, a lot of new rail, and of course there's RAFA military bases up there. And it's important when investing, and of course considering your first family home, you look at a few things such as schooling, uh, proximity to the beach, of course that's, if you're gonna live in Queensland, that's exactly what you want, and you're gonna need to look at drive time. So, a lot of people are migrating up to the north and some of the reasons are just simply um, they're able to sell up in Melbourne and Sydney and of course some of the other states, move there, have some money left back in the bank uh, and live a quality of, quality of life which obviously gets them a little bit closer to overseas if they choose to travel and they're coming back here in the summers and spending some time back in Sydney and Melbourne. So Queensland, um, some of the major hotspots that are really coming up at the moment uh, in the, I guess in the greenfields, which is undeveloped land, are places like Logan, which has over 200,000 population. Uh, Toowoomba seeing some significant growth that's more inland, a little bit further in from Epswich, which also got another 200,000. Uh, then a lot of people sometimes are choosing lifestyle. They're going up north towards places like Harvey Bay, Rockhampton, uh, maybe up more further up towards Cairns, and then we're also looking at places like Townsville. Places like Townsville have over 200,000 population as well, but there's a very low vacancy rate. With vacancy rate comes increased rents and of course capital growth. Uh, the government's recently announced it's going to be spending another billion dollars upgrading uh, the military bases there. And the best type of money to have really is the government money there because it's guaranteed income and guaranteed spend into the community. So stay with us, stay tuned, and let's hear about why Queensland is the number one spot to be in Australia at the moment. I'm here with Binju from the Nachi Group. These guys are builders uh, and now been in the industry for how many years? Four years now. Welcome aboard to the new property show. Today, we're gonna cover what you think the five steps are to building a brand new home. So first of all, how long have you been in the building industry? So I myself have been in the industry for five years. We started Nanche Group back in 2018 with my director Sachin Nanche. Mm -hmm. And since then we have just been growing and now we're venturing into the pocket of 80 to 100 homes a year. Congratulations. So, so whereabouts are you building at the moment? Mainly in the north area and the western. Predominantly in the western suburbs of Tane, Truganina, Windham Vale, Rockbank. And in the north, what are some of the suburbs there? Doreen, Mernda, Mickleham, Donnybrook. These are the ones that we are currently constructing in. Where are you finding, I guess, most of the demand is really coming into is in the north? Mainly in the north, I would say towards the Mickleham area and the Donnybrook mm -hmm. because it has the existing train station there mm -hmm. and a lot of developments going towards the beverage area now. I've heard beverage is pretty big, so what's happening in beverage in the next sort of five to ten years? Why, why is that area so popular? One of the reasons why beverage is so popular is because it was considered as a regional area. So when the immigration policy attracted migrants to go towards the regional areas, beverage was one of the hotspots where people wanted to go to. Hence, it got the benefit of the regional grant as well. And since because it's closer to Mickleham and Donnybrook, people found it easier to go to beverage. Now that regional grant was for first home buyers. Is that still $20,000? Yes. Yeah. And Metro uh, is $10,000? $10,000. Okay, so 10000 for the Metro, go a few more kilometres, get into beverage, $20,000. Correct. $20, Correct. Uh, it's 20,000 reasons why you should be <laughs> exactly. beverage. Okay, so uh, what we want to talk about is, I've myself been in the industry now for oh, a little bit over 15 years, 
and we I come from a, I guess a volume builder background where we've built over one sort of 2,000 homes per year. Uh, your company now is doing 80 to uh, 100 homes a year so not only I guess some, some standard floor plans but some beautiful custom designs as well. So I guess I have a question for you. What would you say the first five steps are to building a brand new home? Where would a customer start? The very first step would be to identify the purpose of the property. If it's an investment property or if it's your own living. If it's an investment property you need to understand you might necessarily not need to go for all the inclusion, inclusions and bells and whistles in the property. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's for your own living, identify the pocket where you want to be in, the convenience, the facilities that the estate or the location has to offer. Mm -hmm. That would be the very first step in my opinion mm -hmm. to identify either if it's for your own living or for investment. So would a client typically just walk into a display, um, how much time would they need to spend in a display to get a quote? We work with a different model since we are not a volume builder. Yes. Our, we have positioned ourselves to show houses of our existing customers or which are under construction. Very yes, smart. we have a very completed project, but going through this this direction, we have realized that customers do like it because they see the actual inclusions that's going to go in the house. So you're seeing real homes, not display homes exactly. with the bells and whistles on there. Correct. Perfect. So. Um, after they've walked through a brand new property with you, they've identified some changes. Yes. Um, how quickly do you produce a quote and what's missing out of the quote? For us, it would take around a maximum one day to produce a quote. Mm -hmm. One of the advantages of Nanche Group is that our whole aim was to simplify the whole home buying process. Mm -hmm. We provide fixed upfront pricing. So yes. once we look at the floor plan that you want, we have mm -hmm. this engineering of the land to ascertain the tentative site cost. We go through the inclusions that you want and we give in fixed upfront price, which then takes around a week or two to convert into contracts. Mm -hmm. That's where we position ourselves as different from the volume builders because they usually would take months to produce a contract. I guess, um, so step one is really uh, ascertain a price, uh, ascertain a floor plan, get a fixed price contract. So step one is get the price and contract. Yes. Uh, secondly, I guess it would be deposit. Uh, so after deposit, uh, is there a colour gallery process that, uh, that you need to add on to your, your contract and what yes. would some of those inclusions be? In house and land packages, usually you would classify either as a title land mm -hmm. or off the plan. Because we work lots on title property, so there is a subject to finance. So the customer needs to get building contract, quotations, mm -hmm. drawings and the receipts as well as the land contract. Mm -hmm. These five essential documents to submit to the bank to get the finance approval. So the way we work is we will give you the quotation as discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. We will give a contract within a week mm -hmm. and the drawings as well along with the contract. So you essentially have these three critical documents that you can submit to the bank and they can give you the finance approval within those 14, 21 days. Okay, so step one, contract. Step two, uh, sign the contract, get the finance done. Correct. Now um, we're going to sign. So step three. Step three uh, typically would be land settlement. Uh, what's required to, to get a house onto site? What, what needs to be done? So before the land actually gets settled, we would advise our customers to get the developer's approval done. Mm -hmm. If you're building in a new estate, all estates have a certain requirements of the external color theme mm -hmm. or the way you want to design the house. So this mm -hmm. is a process there where we as a company submit your floor plans and the colors that you've chosen in the mm -hmm. gallery yeah. to get it approved from the developer. Once that is done, we have to go for the pre-site stage mm -hmm. where we have to apply for the permits, get the soil test reports and other documents such as energy rating and then we'll submit for the building permits finally, once the land is ready. Thank you for sharing steps one, two and three. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you on the new property show today. Next week we're going to che check in with steps four and five and we're going to talk about why these are the most essential steps to building a brand new home. Thank you and welcome. Looking forward to it. Thanks. So now we're going to have a little listen to what's happening actually in the industry. There's a lot of discussion around the RBA and what's happening in terms of prices falling. There's been some recent articles in the press that talk about prices falling up to 20%. Um, now that could be across the board, could be in the established market. Certainly not seeing that in the new home market as prices continue to escalate with building costs and land is still in short supply. Uh, we're also going to check in with interest rates and what's happening there. Uh, how is that affecting the household income? What are the tips and tricks that you can do to actually uh, minimise your expenditure and increase your savings so that you can live a quality lifestyle? 
And we did hear from one of our previous panel experts where they said that people are building smaller, but we want to look at economical ways where you can still build a bigger home for less money and still maximise that. That may mean giving up some of the extras that you had in your home or doing some of the fixtures and fittings afterwards, such as driveways, landscaping, fences, and just moving in to a property that may require a couple of years. Uh, last but not least, we're gonna hear from, I guess, the builders, the land experts, and of course, some real estate agents in upcoming episodes, what their thoughts are on the market and see if the market's still moving in a positive direction for them. I look forward to getting some feedback. Of course, if you're watching as an audience member, love you to sort of tap in and give us some of the questions and some of your thoughts and opinions in terms of what you think's happening in the market and where property prices are gonna go. My idea is that property always continues to go up. So it's just a long, slow process. The longer you're in the market, the more you'll make. The market has been a bit slow because obviously interest rates have gone up, it is affecting buyers but I'm pretty sure it's not going to be like that for long. There are still many, many opportunities for people out in the market. See, to be very honest, we are in Australia which is a very growing country. Many immigrants coming in, many people are out there, good earning capacity for everyone so there are always investment opportunities. Rents are at historic highs here in Victoria, so for people who are looking to get into an investment property, rent it out, um, and you know, and re you know, realise that goal of expanding on their portfolio or even or even starting an investment portfolio, it's a great time to do that because of the ease with which you can get your investment property rented at the moment. I think that the interested people that are very serious about building are there. However, there are a lot of people that are feeling um, a bit more. Uh, worry or concern about what's happening in the industry in relation to higher interest rates um, uh, and the sentiment in the economy. So I think that as we get a bit more positivity, then of course the market will rebound because at the end of the day, everyone needs somewhere to live. Um, it's starting to come back, I think, a little bit now. It's, uh, the people are getting a bit more confident. Um, we're talking to a lot of people that are, um, I suppose, after some house and land packages, we've teamed up with some local builders to give some idea of price and um, some time, time frame. So there is a little bit of interest coming back. So. So I know that the media talks a lot about, you know, interest rates are going up and people are going to struggle and, you know, there's a lot of pressure and there's going to be a market crash, etc, etc. And we all heard that back in, you know, during the GFC. I know that not only developers but investors who went against um, is that counterintuitive investing. We got in at that time and there was so-called blood on the streets. They have done extremely well. So us developers and investors, what we look for is when there's blood on the street, there's the real opportunity. It has started to pick up again, which is good, but I think once the interest rates settle down, everybody will settle down. Um, but there are buyers out there, everyone's really excited, um, so that's it. Lots of opportunities in the community. So we've seen a lot of time constraints, uh, financial constraints in there, but we've been very fortunate to be able to navigate our way through and then come out the other end even stronger, which has been great for our investors, our buyers, uh, you know, our employees, our suppliers, um, all of our you know, wealth of clients has been good. That scepticism will go away and I think the market will start to pick itself up in roughly, probably anywhere between six to twelve month mark it will pick itself up again and get rolling again thank you for joining us once again on this panel a new question how would you go about selecting the right builder uh, in 2022 
lots of research to start with, lots of listening. I would personally go and drive to like new subdivisions yeah. and see what builders are building and creating and writing it down or speak to a builder broker who's got options with multiple builders. So you're more like getting your feet on the ground mm. um, and going, you mean pre-COVID and really just going in there and doing the work and seeing who's actually building. Uh, cool, I'd love to hear from... Coming yeah. from a debt position, I'd look at their credit rating and do some background checks on the builders and on whether they're, what company, whether what builds they've done before, whether it's just a company that's set up just for that particular build um, and where their credit scores sit. So how would you do that? Oh, there's a whole heap of different ways. <laughs> 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 Behind the scenes. ASIC searches, you can also, credit reporting scores can be made public. Uh, and what about you, Katie? How, um, how do you go about selecting the right Well, I think as part of the home yeah. build mentoring program, mm -hmm. um, one of the things is helping clients choose their builders when they're doing a custom build or a major renovation. So in that process, um, it's not just choosing the home plan and the builder all wrapped up in one. You've really got your custom design and you need to find a builder that suits both you and your project. Um, so doing the research and, and one of the things I teach in the program is to, to choose a builder that has the right mechanics and the right dynamics. So in terms of my net, um, sorry, mechanics, they're really the tick box items in terms of finding the right builder for your project. So they tend to be things like making sure they have the right insurances, they've got the right registration, um, find out from other people, get referrals so that you can understand um, that, that they've had a successful process with them and how everything works. And the other side of it is really d the dynamics. And this is the side that's probably less considered by people when they go into a build. So it's really easy to compare two contracts and say, this one looks heaps better because it's cheaper and I'll go with them. But they find the process kind of falls apart and is less enjoyable because they haven't considered the dynamic side, which is really that you feel trust with the builder, um, you know, that you, that you have faith that they're actually going to follow through and do what they say and also that you've got really clear lines of communication. You understand how the project's going to unfold and how you're going to communicate in terms of when you're going to visit on site and so forth. Um, sometimes you can have the right builder the wrong person uh, because they represent the brand. Um, so it's not just necessarily just about picking the right builder. I think what you've, t um, and the word you used there was trust. What would you do then to build that, to find that person to trust? It would be to, to ask the questions. You need to ask a lot of questions up front. And um, certainly asking, again, like I said, the referrals, uh, talking to people that they've worked with before, and also really taking the time to get to know them. If they're, if they're brushing you off and they're not going to sit down and talk about how the process is going to unfold and actually take the time to, to run through with that, that through, sorry, with you early, then it's likely that that um, position and that feeling is going to follow through to the build. And another thing you should be careful of is when you talk to a building company, is you might get a great feeling for the person that you sit down and talk with, and I think you might have been touching on this, that you say, oh yeah, the company seemed great, I met with Greg, and, and he was wonderful, he sat sorry, down... Greg. And <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Greg. Um, but, uh, <laughs> that, um, you know, I felt great, I felt, you know, we had a, you know, we got along really well, and then um, you start the construction process, and they say, oh, no, you don't deal with Greg anymore. Like, you know, y you've got Jerry, and Jerry's no good. <laughs> like. So you've selected a builder, mm -hmm. you've got a price, um, then there's a thing called colour gallery. Um, so what happens there with variations in colour gallery? How, how, how much typically are people spending nowadays on top of a, a build contract? Uh, great question. Mm -hmm. Three to four years ago, it was just... On the contract, but what we're all, what we're noticing is um, clients are signing fixed contracts and they're sending us a nice little cheeky email. Man, you hope you well. Just notice we've changed this and the cost has gone up. Um, generally, most lenders are okay, okay with it if the equity's there and the loan to value ratio is standard. Um, but some lenders aren't all okay with it. So what I always recommend is telling my clients, go to the builder, make sure that you're 100% happy with your colours and selections, don't change your mind halfway through because if you do, the bank needs to recess it like from scratch. And what they approved you at the start might be different now. Yeah. So Olga, with, I guess with your new knowledge, um, you've never built a home before, have you? So no, never. 
now you've you've done your research, you've done your credit, um, you know to go out and get the quotes. So what would you then look for for your for your builder? Would you go to reviews? I'd um, look for Katie. <laughs> <laughs> Same. I'd be like, Perfect. hi. <laughs> that's, so you think that's having the right people around you is also important. Yeah, that's yeah. that's exactly what I would do and what I would look for in that situation. Perfect. And what about um, I guess during the build process, how would you keep an eye on it? You're obviously a very busy professional. What, what would you do then? Um, I think part of it would be using service providers that know so much more that I don't, that have expertise in that area, um, would be a big part of what I do. If I lived in the same state, I'd probably drive by, not that I'd know what I was looking at, um, but I'd like to see it. Uh, recapping what you've said is you've done the reviews, mm -hmm. you've met the personality, you've made sure that Greg's either in or out of the picture, yeah. Um, but you need a team that carries that through. We're going to carry that through on some further episodes, but you, it's not just the, build, um, the builder itself, it's making sure the builder gets complete. Uh, we need to see this all the way through. And the last but not least question, and I'll just get a quick summary here. Um, what do you think is not included when you select a builder? I think you've got to be really careful of the contract. Um, and what's included and excluded in that. Um, so when you presented, you know, you're comparing pricing from potential builders, one can automatically look much more attractive than another one, but when you really delve into it and look at the details of that fee proposal, it can include a lot of prime cost and provisional sum items that can make one, um, one fee proposal look a lot better than another. Just a little bit more detail, prime cost, what's a prime cost? So a prime cost is an allowance for an item. So just for example, is say it's a, 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 a sink mixer f mm -hmm. for the kitchen and there's an allowance of $200, but the one you really want is 1,000. So when you, when you buy the one for 1,000, then you're already automatically gonna be charged an extra $800 plus the builder's margin on top of that. So that's just one small example, but when you've got 20 of those filtered through the contract or the, the fee proposal, and, and they can really quickly add up to 20, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars more. So it's really looking at the fee proposals in detail right from the start. Uh, provisional sum, what's that? Provisional sum is the, it, it, it's either the labour or the mm -hmm. labour and the um, provide, um, purchase item together. So for example, it might be joinery. So um, that requires the purchase of the material and the actual um, making of it by the cabinet maker. So you know, you might have an, an allowance for, for joinery in a contract for $50,000, but when you get your kitchen designed exactly how you want it, that comes out at 90. So automatically you've got 40,000 more plus the builder's margin on top. Next one, uh, what do you think uh, not included? Not included? Uh, oh. What's five key items? that you normally see that people have to do after handover? Oh, landscaping yes. is a big one, and driveway. And it costs a fortune. It can cost a lot of money. In the yeah, end. just build it into the contract, yeah. wouldn't you? Yeah, <laughs> so we, we find it that a lot of customers are excluding landscaping and driveway to save costs. Because automatically they think that it's going to be a cheap option that they can do on their own and they can save up for, but yeah, really, it can cost a lot of money to do... So. And what we're finding as well is they will come back and say, oh, landscaping is going to cost $20,000, the driveway is going to cost $30,000, which totals fifty grand." And that was a mm -hmm. conversation we had 12 months ago. Cost of goods have gone up in 12 months. That $50,000 has gone up to $70,000. They're freaking out. Mm. But another thing they can consider is uh, once they complete the build, they might have gained equity in the property which we can organise a free valuation to determine how much equity is available. And if it is available and you can service a loan, we can increase the loan to be able to organise I think that. as long as you, um, you know about it, that's okay. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Uh, we look forward to digging into this deeper. Uh, we'll come back to you with a complex list of what's not included. Uh, thank you for joining us today on this episode. Thank you.